Greetings. Hello, my name is the Suicide Coordinator at Haywood Healthcare. And today we're going to bring you on that journey of good health and successful health outcomes for you and your family with two great guests from the Athol Orange area. First, we have Dr. Mariani Cruz. Uh, Dr. Cruz is a general practitioner at Athol Hospital in the new, better, improved, bigger um, uh, Athol Hospital Professional Suites. Thank you and welcome for coming. I, I appreciate you coming um, and welcome. Uh, Morgan uh, Bandry is the project manager at the Dana Day Treatment Center at Quabbin Retreat. Uh, lots of good things happening mm -hmm. out at the Quabbin Retreat as it relates to behavioral health and mental health. And so today we're going to be talking a little bit about the programs that you guys are involved in. Doc, you first, if you don't mind. Um, uh, First of all, tell us a little bit about your experience and what brought you to Haywood Healthcare in the Athol area. So, uh, starting from the beginning, uh, I trained as an internal medicine physician uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. I practiced medicine for about nine years, and uh, in my practice, I saw that I had a tremendous amount of patients that were struggling with substance use disorder. So I needed to learn a little bit more about it and decided to go for a fellowship training in the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. So I did a training for uh, addiction medicine training there for a year and a half. Then uh, after finishing that, I decided to I mean, look for a, a place that I could uh, expand my knowledge and uh, try to help uh, patients with substance use disorder. And uh, came to Athol or Haywood uh, uh, group where I interviewed and noticed that they were doing great job for mental health and substance use disorder. So me, uh, my wife and me decided to move to the area. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Well, thank you. I find it interesting, and uh, before I get into it, remind me to come back to this. I find it interesting, though, that you found this huge correlation um, prevalence of behavioral health, mental health issues among kind of a general practice population. And so understanding, you know, how do general practitioners, how does a primary care physician really get involved in care as it relates to behavioral health will be something we'll talk a little bit more about today. Morgan, I have had such a pleasure working with you. Tell us more about what you're doing at the Quabbin Retreat, where it is, what it is, why it's there, um, and how folks can, what, what are the services people can expect to get from sure. Quabbin? Uh, Quabbin Retreat is one of the campuses of Haywood Healthcare, and it's a campus that's specifically designed to provide behavioral health and substance abuse treatment to the North Quabbin area, this area and the Athol Orange area and areas around that. And what we are doing is we're developing various modalities of treatment for substance abuse and behavioral health. We started with um, the wing that I'm working on, which is the Dana Day Treatment Program. All of the wings of the Quabbin Retreat are named for the towns that were part of the Quabbin. So that's why we're Dana Day Treatment. I believe Prescott is the area where we have the uh, NACAG, uh residential program, but we're Dana Day. We're a day treatment program and we offer a variety of different types of counseling at Quabbin. We have a three and a half hour day treatment program that's insurance funded through um, MBHP and some of the private insurances where folks can come for an intensive treatment three and a half hours every day, five days a week for about two weeks. And it's addiction issues and behavioral health issues because usually the two go hand in hand. Right. So we do have that. We also have individual cl um, counseling available at the Quabbin Retreat and we have clinicians who work with Dr. Cruz and Dr. Fitzgerald in their Suboxone and medication assisted treatment programs in their primary care offices. They run groups right in the Athol primary care and at the Haywood Hospital at Dr. Fitzgerald's and Compass Primary Care. That's, I mean, it, it just is so intriguing. Um, I, I'll, I'll take a minute and talk a little bit more about the Quabbin Retreat. It used to be a organization of, of nuns that owned and operated. It's a beautiful, beautiful facility. When we talk about campus, this really, truly um, identifies 
with one of the other t of the two campuses, Athol Hospital and Haywood Hospital. It really is a nice fit. If you haven't been there, folks, oh, take a, take a ride by the the Quabbin Retreat uh, from a, as part of Haywood Healthcare. It is unbelievable. And so there's a lot going on there. You talked about McLean, mm -hmm. uh, not keg program going on in the day in the day treatment center. Any idea long term what other types of services might be provided? Is we're in the process right now of exploring a lot of different options so nothing has been really decided on right now they were talking at one point about doing a um, children and adolescent residential program there I don't know if that's going to be the direction we go in we were looking at perhaps a woman's uh, sober house but we're, we're still looking at a lot of different yeah, options and there right are now. so many organizations providing services and we want to make sure that we fit you know, a real need that we fill that gap. So um, for both of you, maybe you can tell me a little bit, what are you seeing that's uh, new trends in your, in your care environments? Um, things that are kind of like surfacing now that maybe didn't exist 10 years ago. And how can patients then expect a different type of response from their primary care doc as, relate, as it relates to those trends. So let's go to you first, Dr. Cruz. So definitely, I mean, as a primary care, uh, we are the point of entrance to the healthcare system. So we see a variety of things like other providers won't see. But uh, definitely we see a lot of uh, mental health, depression, anxiety, um, uh, mood disorders, uh, sleep issues that uh, needs to be addressed early on. More so now than say 10 years ago? No, like definitely not. Oh. I, I would say that definitely depression, uh, you're seeing, you are seeing more especially in really? younger people than in uh, elderly population. I, I have to say in my practice I'm seeing it more earlier than I used to. Uh, and definitely sleep disorders uh, uh, more uh, than I would say five, eight years ago. I've only been practicing for 10 years, so yeah. <laughs> I can go that back. Uh, but um, definitely as a primary care, we address all those issues. Uh, also, uh, I have to say alcohol use disorder and of course opioid use disorder. I've been seeing more than I used to in the past. It's amazing you brought up alcohol use disorder because when we talk about substance use disorders, people think of all of the exotic types of substances, the opiates or other types of, of um, you know, narcotics and things like that. But substance abuse disorder, um, alcohol is definitely the, still the, the first and primary most prevalent type of substance use disorder. Would you agree with that? I, I definitely agree. And I have to say that I'm, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, alcohol use disorder now in, in my new practice here. Are you seeing that um, from, from kind of both your perspectives? Are you seeing the prevalence of substance use disorders more frequently in younger people than you did, say, maybe 10 years ago, five will, years ago? I will have to say yes. Younger yeah. people are experiencing more issues with the, uh, substance use disorder in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so Morgan, tell me a little bit about then what are the services or what have you seen mm -hmm. change in the types of services that might have been available 10 years ago for the patients uh, that are being treated at the Dana Day Treatment Center? Well, I can't speak for 10 years ago because Dana Day wasn't in existence 10 years ago, but what I'm seeing in my experience is that there's a lot more um, different sorts of substances being used together, which is really dangerous. and. I agree with Dr. Cruz, the alcohol use is really prevalent in this area. And it is becoming a problem for younger and younger, younger folks. And it's really dangerous because of the levels that they're, they're drinking and they're using at. Yeah, kind of like these binge levels that we used to consider were infrequent mm -hmm. are now becoming much more frequent. Daily. Um, you know, we know that there's a kind of higher occurrence and prevalence of, of substance use disorders and mental health and behavioral health issues. As it relates to primary care, how do people access services for care as it relates to behavioral health and mental health services from a, from a primary care doc? What should they expect uh, to see and encounter uh, from their doctor and what should they ask? Well, how does that work for someone who may be suffering from a substance use disorder to get you know, further treatment? So uh, that's a great question, Mike, because um, the, as, as I said, primary care is the, where patients go first for any kind of uh, treatment. Uh, a lot of the patients, they, there's the stigma on, I don't want to talk to anybody about uh, substance use. So primary care should be screening all, every patient on their physical exam and about any uh, substance, possible substance use disorder, and also uh, mental health, especially depression and anxiety. Uh, so sometimes it's uh, the job of the clinician to try to screen and diagnose and not expect the patient to come up 
okay, and, and, and express that. I'm going to pipe in real quick. I think that is, is such an important and provocative statement that we do screenings, but the screenings are really self-reporting. And so there's a stigma already that folks don't want to, because of that stigma, don't want to share um, that they may be suffering from or with a substance use disorder or even mental illness. They're afraid that there might be some kind of implications or ramifications. So self-reporting isn't generally, you know, the best. And, and training clinicians on where to recognize, how to recognize, um, is certainly a, a, an important facet of, of getting that treatment. So you do the screening. What's next? So once we identified any possible uh, substance use disorder, then definitely you need to uh, uh, g get a, a brief intervention on how to, I mean, if we're talking about substance, uh, how to cut down on, on uh, the substance and then dif the decide if the patient needs a referral to treatment. Some patients just have are at, at risk of use, so doesn't mean they don't meet criteria for a uh, substance use disorder, and they just need a small brief intervention, five ten minutes, and they don't need to go to a specialist for for treatment. A patient that have more advanced conditions of substance use then definitely need to be referred to uh, a more specialized uh, training physician or trained physician or uh, a specialized center. So that physician gets the understands and sees the results of the screening, either through the conversation or the self-reporting, and they make a referral out. And one of the places they may refer is the day-to-day -day treatment center. What should or can a person expect? You talk about intense um, counseling, mm -hmm. intense treatment. Um, tell me a little bit more about what that really looks mm -hmm. like for somebody who is suffering from a, a mental health, behavioral health, substance use mm -hmm. disorder, and what those services look like for them. What can they expect? Okay, our day treatment program usually consists of groups as opposed to individual. Most of the treatment in the day treatment program is three groups basically during the three and a half hours that they're with us. Some of it is uh, talk therapy, some of it is a process group, some of it is activity because we also take a holistic view of treatment and of taking care of someone who's dealing with behavioral health or substance use. So it could be um, you were talking about the, the campus that we have. We have beautiful gardens out back. So a lot of times in the good weather, our clinicians will take groups out to the gardens to be able to have a group out there. It can consist of talk. It also can consist of doing some gardening if that's something that they enjoy doing. Uh, the walk back and forth to the gardens is also part of of teaching. We use everything as a teaching opportunity. So working exercise into treatment, working environment into treatment. We also do a lot of connecting because this is a, um, a social media kind of world that we live in right now. So there's a lot of good information out on the web. We use TED Talks and YouTube videos as part of our instruction. We try to keep it as varied as possible to touch all the different learning aspects that people have but also so that we can keep people focused on what we're trying to do. If we were just talking at them for three and a half hours a day, we would probably lose the interest of them somewhere along the first 15 minutes. But with a lot of other things going on, they're able to engage. And our clinicians are also checking in one-on-one -on -one with all of our patients coming in for the day treatment program. So that if they have something specific that they want to talk about that they don't want to bring up in the group, they can, they can meet individually with their clinician. And we have a care coordinator on site who helps them get access to primary care, helps them apply for different services in the community they might need, like food stamps, SNAP benefits. Um, if they're looking for sober housing or residential placement after they leave us, we can help make referrals and facilitate the application process for that. We try to hit as many different areas as possible to make their treatment as effective as possible. I think the care coordination piece in and of itself is such a huge component. Mm -hmm. My next question is going to really be a, a difficult one, and that's, um, you know, while they're in that, that safe environment, while they're in that nurturing environment or that, um, you know, counseling therapeutic mm -hmm. environment, uh, you know, it's kind of easy to conform or to start to look at um, what are the things you need to do to be safe and healthy and, mm -hmm. and kind of process uh, through some of the stuff that's happening in your life. How, what are the kinds of things we can do to ensure or entrust that our folks are taking care of themselves? And what are the barriers for them um, really having successful outcomes even while engaged in the services we provide? Morgan, I'll mm -hmm. start with you. 
I think the saddest thing and the most difficult thing to grapple with is the fact that a lot of our folks coming into our treatment are coming into it out of less than ideal circumstances in the home. So they might come to us, they might be able to deal with their substance use in our facility, and they're going back to an environment where there may be other users in the home, where there may be, they're living in an area where if they walk out their front door, their dealer is on the street. It's not a safe cocoon once they leave us, which is why we work so hard to try to get services in place for them before they leave us in terms of hooking them up with local AA groups if that's their thing, hooking them up with the North Quabbin Recover Center on, in Athol or the Gardner Alyssa's Place, places where they can go and still feel safe even if they're not in active treatment. And if they're interested in really removing themselves from their environment which isn't safe, we'll help them try to identify some sober housing and possibly get them into that. Yeah, I, it sounds really interesting and it sounds really complicated. Again, you know, while they're in services or they're in a treatment program where there are a lot of supports mm -hmm. um, built in and around them, it sounds like it would be more successful. But eventually those treatments yeah. end. Dr. Cruz? Yeah, so that's part of the, uh, the clinician's job is to find out what are the barriers for the patient or the person to stay uh, sober and in remission from the substance use. And one of the things that you need to address is like the social life, where you live, how you have transport to go to your appointments. And that's something that we try to do, especially I lean more into the uh, Morgan's hand there to help me with those things. Uh, but definitely that's something that needs to be addressed because it's like you say, they have an, a structure while they're in, inpatient or where they're attending their in, uh, uh, a partial hospitalization or a intensive outpatient program, but one day, once they detach from that structure, it's a little bit challenging for them to keep up. Uh, from my side, I try to keep, after they leave that uh, safe environment, if we can call it that way, is that I try to keep close appointments, close follow-ups, frequent follow-ups, so I can check on them and see how things are going. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think that, that consistent follow-up and um, support and, and kind of reaffirming those types of tools and coping mechanisms that have been worked on or developed in some kind of a therapeutic treatment facility uh, is important, especially in that, that interim period where they're just, you know, now starting to recognize that the substance use disorders are creating a, a detrimental effect on their health, um, which could be their social health, their, their love life, their, you know, relationships, their work could have so many different effects. What are people's options? I mean, what are, what are some of the options that we can give to our patients and at Haywood Healthcare as they relate to substance use disorders? We know day, day treatment center is one option. Are there other options? So definitely, uh, I think one of the most important ones is having a, a primary care physician that understands the condition I agree. And, and can make a referral in case they don't feel comfortable dealing or treating that kind of uh, uh, substance use. I think that's the most important because patients, I mean, they end up going to their primary care for everything. So that's one thing that I always recommend. Then definitely the day in a day care center. Uh, there's a lot of other private uh, um, uh, places that patients can attend uh, depending on availability of beds and uh, insurance and, in, and insurance company. Um, AA uh, meetings, which is our free they can access at any time. Some patients have some uh, challenges going to AA because they, ha they have a lot of the religion and uh, Judeo-Christian uh, belief. And there's also what uh, another program called Smart Recovery that has no religion at all. So multiple options that we can explore, yeah. yeah. One new thing that's come on the horizon probably in the last five years is the availability of recovery coaches for folks and recovery coaches are mostly folks who have gone through a state approved training program but they also have had lived experience a lot of the recovery coaches have come out of addiction themselves ha are been in long-term recovery and then want to turn around and give back and help other people who are still struggling with addiction they've gone through training and they're able to meet with folks in the community make sure they get to the AA group make sure th they know about services in their area and I think that that is something that's that's really important and it's only going to grow in importance as time goes on possibly because of the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of it 
um, we're the experts, the medical expert, the behavioral health expert, but when you have somebody who really can say, hey, hey man, I've lived this. this, I've gone through this, I've come out of this, this is something that you can, you can handle, really makes a difference. I think that's a huge, a huge statement, a huge piece of information for folks that are struggling with a mental health issue or behavioral health issue to know that there's hope, yeah. that there is, um, you know, recovery is possible and living a successful and mm -hmm. happy and healthy mm -hmm. life after substance use disorder is possible. That's yeah. hu that's absolutely huge. And recovery coaches, <coughs> I just want to make a gratuitous plug for, for Haywood Healthcare, Athol Hospital and Haywood Hospital. We've just employed, uh, signed a contract with an agency to, to provide recovery coaches in our emergency department so that as folks that are coming into the ED with substance use disorder as a primary or secondary diagnosis, we're connecting them right away with mm -hmm. that, that peer recovery mm -hmm. coach. I agree with you, it's a huge, um, it's a huge asset and benefit long-term mm -hmm. for somebody in recovery. And we also use that same agency for recovery coaches coming out of uh, Dana. Dana, Dana. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That agency, we're being elusive, that agency is Gamma, um, and they have such an important role they, in, in such a big part they play in the behavioral health and mental mm -hmm. health of our community. And so we really appreciate the work sure that they do, do um, in supporting our patients. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the other options is med medication-assisted treatment. Um, MAT, as it's often referred to, is um, I think a fairly new phenomenon. Uh, it's been around a little while, but it's really gaining a lot of popularity. Doc, can you tell us a little bit, uh, Dr. Cruz, a little bit about medication-assisted treatment and what that looks like and who might be appropriate for medication-assisted treatment? So if we talk about the opioid use disorder, there's a three approved medications that we can use to, uh, for opioid use disorder. And they are methadone, buprenorphine, or suboxone, and naltrexone, or Bivitrol, which is the brand name. For methadone, I mean, definitely, uh, that, only, that can only be prescribed in a federally qualified uh, methadone clinic. So you, you, you can, as a primary care, you can prescribe methadone for addiction in a, in a primary care setting. Then you have a uh, buprenorphine or suboxone, which the physician needs a, a waiver to be able to prescribe that uh, medication. And in the area, there's a few providers that, that can prescribe the medication. I would like to see more providers uh, uh, doing that because it saves lives. Um, and that's right now one of the first line treatment for opioid use disorder is uh, buprenorphine. Uh, the other one is naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist, uh, which is the uh, patient known as Bivitrol. Naltrexone is an oral pill that you take every day, and there's an injected form that is once, uh, one injection every 28 days. Um, so the use of medication to assist your treatment for recovery is what we call medication-assisted treatment. I always give the same speech to my patients when I talk to them, and it's called medication-assisted treatment treatment. So we are assisted, assisting your treatment with medications. Your main treatment is going to be this, counseling, building up your coping skills right. on how to deal with a, your day life and how to deal what's going on inside that's leading you to for a substance use. So medication is going to help you with the physical a component of the, of the substance use, the withdrawal, the cravings, a, the depression, the anxiety, but if we don't build up that coping skill to deal with those things without medication, we are, we're going to have a high risk of relapse. So, again, medication-assisted treatment. What a, what a very important uh, message to underscore to our viewers today that, that treatment is, is comprehensive and that one modality isn't going to necessarily make for successful outcomes. It's really that combination of things that go into the mix to, to treat folks that are suffering either from behavioral health but also mental health, right? Mm -hmm. um, that there are a lot of options to assist folks that are struggling with uh, some kind of a mental health issue, including medication assisted and um, not on, it o on its own, combined with some kind of a counseling or uh, other intervention. You also brought up something that I bring up at just about every uh, opportunity I can, and that's having a great relationship with your primary care physician that no treatment. There's no, nothing that can happen in a person or patient's life that um, is going to happen without the, the 
input and the, the, the participation of the primary care. So if you have a terrible relationship with your primary care doc, if you're not comfortable talking about to them about whatever's going on in your life, it's time to get a new primary care doc. That's what I usually said to my patients. Like, if there's one doctor that, that you need to be comfortable with, it needs to be your primary care. If you don't feel comfortable with your primary care, get a new one because, I mean, that's the one that you go for everything. And if you need a referral to see a, a specialist, it needs to come from your primary care. So get a good relationship with your primary care. Yeah, yeah. and we, we would agree with that, I oh, imagine. Absolutely, particularly when you're talking about substance use disorder. You were talking earlier about doing the brief screenings and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. But if somebody doesn't trust their primary care, they're not going to open it's up. It's not going to yeah. happen. Yeah. So what are some of the barriers? We talked about stigma being one of the barriers that folks don't, mm -hmm. um, not only don't disclose uh, substance use disorders, but don't disclose mental health disorders that mm -hmm. may be going on in life or other crises yeah. going on in life. What are some of the barriers? I mean, why would somebody, um, you know, not want to share that with their doc or their or their treatment provider? So uh, the other thing is that uh, stigma is the the biggest one. Uh, also, afraid that I'm if I share this, I'm going to lose my kids. I'm going to mm -hmm. lose my job. Mm -hmm. And that's big. I mean, you, we need to understand that. I mean, that's a real Is it concern. real? Is it real that if it, somebody came in and said, geez, I have, you know, manic and depressive episodes, or I have major depression, or even suicide ideology, that there could be implications on their family or their job? So th definitely, I mean, as unless you are not putting your kids in danger or yourself uh, life in danger, should not be a problem. Yeah. But, I mean, physicians need to make that decision. When is a time that uh, this can be a problem down the, li down the line? And uh, that's at the discretion of the physician. So, uh, but definitely, I mean, uh, the conversation that you have with your primary care, it's confidential. They're there, there to help. They can help you if you don't open up. They don't yeah. have the crystal ball to say what's going on. Uh, so definitely needs to, needs to have that trust. Yeah, yeah and, w and what's the alternative? I mean, what's the alternative of not having that conversation with the doc and starting to get the treatment? The, the alternative is to continue to suffer in mm -hmm. silence mm -hmm. with the, either the mental health or substance use disorder that you're experiencing. And that, that would really be terrible. That's yeah. an, it's an awful alternative. Uh, but well, I, th I think you mentioned earlier when we were talking about recovery coaches is that one of the most important things is the aspect of hope, to know that no matter what it is you're grappling with, that there is help out there and that there are places available where people can get help. But the stigma, I think, is because in our society, we've had such a separation between physical and then mental, emotional issues, and one was always more acceptable than the other for so long, that we're slowly turning the mindset of society around to say, yeah, it's okay to talk about behavioral health and okay to talk about substance use, but it's still a growing area of acceptability. Oh, I, I totally agree. I think that's just a, a great um, perspective in how do you really d deal with your physical problems? How do you deal with your physical health when you have this, you know, overlying mm -hmm. um, and, and, again, intense mental health or behavioral health issue, right? How do you really and you feel good? you can't separate it. You can't separate it. Yeah. Th that's why the, the disease model of addiction, is a, it, it breaks a little bit with the stigma. I mean, in the past, we used to think or we used to say that uh, addiction or substance mm -hmm. use was more of a moral failure. Mm -hmm. You're weak, you fail, you use drugs. So now with the disease model that uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine uh, presents uh, addiction as a disease, it's a chronic primary relapsing remitted disease of the brain that patients lose control over a substance. So when you see it as a disease, is you have diabetes, I have addiction. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about it. I mean, there's no stigma here. We need to treat you as a disease and let's treat it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, again, and folks, I hope you're hearing that message. Um, it, a lot has changed in our community. A lot has changed in our society as it relates to mental health and behavioral health issues. But we know that there are chemical, physiological changes in a person's, you know, being that uh, coexist with mental health and behavioral health disorders and they can be treated um, just like chronic conditions like cardiac or um, diabetes, blood sugar, liver, you know, all those kind of conditions. You need to have that conversation with your doctor, though. If you're experiencing significant mental health or behavioral health issues, if there's something going, you know, on in your life that's maybe creating some unhealthy outcomes, have the conversation. It starts with the conversation, and know and understand that just because you have that conversation doesn't mean that you're going to be put in a locked room or you're going to lose your kids or lose your job. 
Uh, in fact, what it really means is the likelihood that you'll be able to keep those things gets much higher, mm -hmm. you know, the success rate. Um, you know, something that has happened recently, we just got on the conversation about uh, medication-assisted treatment, is this I idea, if, when we talk about changes in society and how people think about it, providing medication-assisted treatment in the emergency rooms um, for folks that are suffering with a substance use disorder. You want to weigh in on that? What do you think about that? So I think that's awesome because the, the, one of the biggest problems is access to treatment. And where do you see most of the uh, overdose or near overdose is the ER. So if the patient goes for a ER after an overdose, um, they have the first point to treat that patient and to engage that patient in treatment. And there's not a lot of providers uh, prescribing a medication-assisted treatment. So if they can bridge that gap from three days that you can, they're seen in the emergency room and then connected to a provider that can continue their treatment, that saves lives. I mean, it, I think the ER is allowed to give three days prescription for a patient with an opioid use disorder. They can prescribe it, uh, the buprenorphine without having a, a, a subox, what we call a buprenorphine waiver. So I think, again, a, a bridging that treatment, it's a, incredible, and a patient should know about that. I agree. Anything that you can do to separate the time factor between an overdose and maybe a next use and the medication-assisted treatment coming out of the ER will do that. Gives us a little bit more time to be able to find a referral, find a, a physician to continue the treatment, get them into a higher level of care if that's what they need. Anything that buys time is a plus. You said anything I could possibly want to say and more. I think that you know we treat on the spot, Johnny on the spot, folks that have high blood pressure, people that are coming in with um, you know, diabetes, we, we give them medication to go home, pain, we give them medication to go home, and for so long we kind of just said, oh well, you know, if you have a substance use disorder, you know, good luck. Mm -hmm. um, we know that you'll probably go back and access those uh, substances again, and we're really not going to do anything to support you. So changing that dynamic alone by, by simply providing medication assisted treatment in the ED I think is huge. So it's really nice to hear from you. So, um, what's any last messages you'd like to, to give out or make today that maybe we haven't talked about? Anything you'd like to uh, have our audience know or understand? No, I think that uh, one, one message is that Haywood uh, Healthcare, Haywood Hospital, Athol, and Quabbin, they, they, they're offering a great service. I mean, patients go to the ER, and there's a few providers that they can get uh, in contact with to treat any type of substance use disorder either at Haywood or at Athol. And from then, uh, they can spread where they need to go for uh, counseling or any mental health uh, treatment. So uh, we're lucky to have that uh, uh, resource in the area. And um, Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree <laughs> with you. We're so lucky. Think about across our great and glorious commonwealth in this country of ours, how many community hospitals and healthcare systems mm -hmm. has, have failed and closed in the last 20 years, and Haywood Hospital, Haywood Healthcare, Athol Hospital, Clavin Retreat, continues to identify those services that aren't being met, right, for our physical and mental health, uh, emotional needs. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you. It's just a great, robust, um, integrated system. Um, are there things we could do maybe to improve it? Sure, but uh, in a small community like Gardner, in a small community like Athol, small community like uh, Petersham, to have these kinds of facilities. It's definitely one. Yeah. Morgan, anything you'd like I to share? I think one of the things I'd really want to emphasize is even if someone thinks that they don't qualify or they won't um, be diagnosed with a, a, a diagnosis that would be able to be used at Quabbin Retreat for treatment, call us anyway. If they have a question, if they want to find out about resources in the area, what we want to do is we want to be seen as a clearinghouse for information for substance use treatment in the area. So we can be a very good place to start if somebody's just exploring the possibility of maybe I could use some treatment, call us and we can funnel people in the right direction. Yeah, two very important messages. Have that conversation with your doctor and, and use that office as a referral source. But we have the services, we have the people, mm -hmm. we have the knowledge yeah. at the Quabbin Retreat to help somebody kind of navigate through that sometimes difficult um, uh, you know, pathway to treatment, mm -hmm. identifying what treatment's appropriate not only for themselves, but for their loved ones. Right? Yeah. So having that conversation with your doc about somebody who you know who's um, you know, struggling 
is an important first step is recognizing and reaching out for help and support. You two have been awesome. Thank you so much for being here today with me. I hope you enjoyed it. I know that our uh, viewers will. A lot of information to take back with them. We'll have you back on the show uh, soon because I don't think this issue is one of those issues that's going to go away or that we can yeah. ever provide too much information on. Dr. Cruz, Morgan, thank you both for being here today. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Haywood Health Beat talking again today about behavioral health and mental health issues. If you or someone you know is struggling with a mental health or behavioral health issue, please um, consider, consider having that conversation with your doctor and getting the treatment. You do not have to suffer in silence. You don't have to suffer at all. We can um, provide you the resources to get you the help you need over the long term. There is hope, there is help, there is Haywood. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. This has been the Haywood Health Beat.